at GEO appreciate every one of you being frontline workers. It really means a lot. Um, my name is Emily. Uh, I'm actually a registered nurse. I started off my career working in the trauma unit at the Civic. I actually did two placements at CHEO on uh, five east and four north. Um, so yeah, I'm, pretty, I'm familiar with, with CHEO and I really love the work that everyone does there. Um, now I still work as a nurse. I work at the Center for Health Innovation, which is formerly known as the Ottawa Integrative Cancer Center. So I work there as well, but uh, the majority of the time, what I do is personal training. So I'm a certified personal trainer and I train clients out of my studio. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about foot health and specifically foot health for, for healthcare workers. Uh, my interest in foot health really developed while I was working um, at, at the hospital because I started to develop foot pain. And like many other nurses do, many healthcare workers who spend long hours on their feet, uh, foot pain is almost just like inevitable and we don't really think much of it and maybe we'll, we'll switch to orthotics and you know foot health is something that we should care about as foot, as healthcare workers with, we're, we're the people who work the longest hours on our feet so I think it's really crucial that we, we do think about our feet and how we talk uh, and and how we care for it um, so I decided to start diving in to learn more about the foot and how it functions because what I'm it's talking to a lot of the nurses that I worked with um, but my feet are really killing me. What do I do about it? They're like, oh, well, you can get orthotics. You can get more supportive shoes. And people would just get more and more supportive shoes and they still have foot pain. So I felt like a piece of the puzzle was kind of missing there. So I learned more about the feet and how the feet function. And that's how I ultimately fixed my own plantar fasciitis. And I've also helped many other healthcare employees uh, with their foot problems as well, fixing bunions, plantar fasciitis, policeman's heel, you know, you you name it, uh, Achilles injuries. Um, so today I want to be able to give you some tangible tips that you can do on a daily basis or when you need it so that you can care for your own feet. Um, I think everyone's mute, muted in the chat, but if you have questions, you can, you can ask uh, throughout or you can write it in, in the chat uh, as well. And I, I will answer as best as I can. If I can't find the answer, I will get back to you with it. Um, the way I learned about foot health, health took a very natural approach and uh, took an approach that takes a whole lifestyle change. So I actually, I very rarely wear shoes anymore. And my, and my whole, I mean, it also kicked off the, the business that I have. So the, the way that I view health is very holistic. Uh, it takes an approach that um, takes a long time to do. It's not a quick fix and it's something we should work at daily, okay? So my objective today is to give you tools that you need that you can just simply care for your feet. So let's talk a little bit about the foot. Um, we wanna think about the foot as the foundation, right? It is what keeps us balanced. It is what get, allows us to move locomotion and it gives us sensory input from the ground, right? It's oftentimes the only two things that touch the ground in the entire day, yet we don't really care for it much or we don't even think about our feet on a day-to-day -day basis but if we didn't have our feet or if our feet weren't functioning well we would really know one example of this is when i was working in the trauma unit there was uh, we used to get a lot of elderly falls and one thing that i noticed was that with um, people who would fall often it would be maybe oftentimes they were diabetic uh, or like end-stage diabetes where they had peripheral neuropathy so they didn't necessarily feel what was on the ground and their balance was thrown off because of it. Um, and so, you know, now when we're able to walk, fine, we don't, we kind of take that for granted. So it's something that I want to start focusing on. It's our foundation. It's what's going to set the stage for everything upstream. Each foot is composed of 26 bones, 33 joints, four layers of muscles and about 7,000 uh, nerve endings. So that's a lot going on there. Um, the rest of the body also has muscles, nerves, blood vessels, both like tissues. Uh, but for some reason we treat the feet very different than we treat the, the rest of the body. Um, if we start to care for our feet the same way we care for the rest of the body, it's gonna look very similar to what we, we do. So we do need exercise and strength training we do need mobility work and we also need rest. So I'm going to teach you about all of those things that we can specifically target the foot. So mobility work, um, foot issues 
often can stem from the, the hip. So I'm gonna give you an example of this. I, this is something that I get all the time. And if you would want to follow along, if you're in, a, in an environment where you're able to follow along, I highly encourage you to. If not, it's recorded. So if you're able to do it uh, later tonight, I encourage you to follow along because it's a lot. Uh, you'll be able to notice a very palpable difference when we care for our feet. Okay, so one of the big things that I get is, well, I have flat feet. So I just want you to take a look at my arch, right? You can see I, my foot's flat right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to externally rotate my hip. And what you'll notice is that I'll start to develop an arch. So an arch is actually just made by bones and muscles. So we can control it. If the arch is collapsed because the muscles are weak, we're going to have a flat foot like this, but we can also develop an arch. And an arch is really important. You can see that the foot's very flexible here and the foot should be flexible and, and mobile because it has to be able to, um, to allow us to walk and engage with the di differences environments that we interact with. So starting at the hips, if we spend a lot of time sitting, this is going to affect everything downstream. So we want, when I start with mobility work for the feet, I actually like to start at the hips. So the first thing we're gonna do is called a hip flexor stretch. So if you are at home and you're in a space that you can do this, we're gonna go onto one knee. If you, if you have a yoga mat, you can always roll up the end of the yoga mat and put that underneath your knee. Get a little bit out of the way. Right, so hip flexor stretch right in here. So if you spend a lot of time sitting in a chair, these can get really tight and it can affect it downstream. What happens, it's like having a clamp in this position. When you have a clamp, the hip flexors are tight, you have two options. You can stand like this, which some people opt to do, or we make compensations, right, to stand upright. So maybe it's tight, we make compensations. You can see my lower back has to compensate for it. So oftentimes I see a lot of people who spend a lot of time sitting have low back pain as well. If your hips are constantly in flexion, it means that it's really hard to get into extension, which means I can't use my glutes, I can't use my hamstrings, but I still need to walk, I still need to move around. So what happens is I use my low back, it kind of takes over the job of the butt, and I use my calves a lot more, which are not designed to take the same amount of load as the hamstrings and the glutes. So low, addressing the low hanging fruit is important, so we're gonna stretch the hip flexors. To stretch the hip flexor, I often see this People will do something like this, where they'll drive their hips forward, their hands will come overhead. But that more addresses the, the abdominals and the quads. To address the hip flexors, we have to do what's called a pelvic tilt, posterior pelvic tilt. So I like to think like I have a tail and I'm trying to tuck it between my legs and keep my chest upright, and then I would shift my weight forward. So if you're able to give it a try, you're gonna feel a deep stretch in here. My general rule of thumb is to, for every hour that you spend seated in a flexed position, you want to do at least one minute per side of this hip flexor stretch. All right, so you would hold it there, you focus on getting your breathing, and then you would switch sides. Okay, so that's your hip flexor stretch, opening everything up if you spend a lot of time sitting. So if you, if you sit for eight hours a day, that can be a lot of sitting. That ends up being 16 minutes total of just a hip flexor stretch, which most people do not have the time to sacrifice that. So what I encourage people to do is to spend less time sitting um, in the, this flex position. You can sit on the ground. We can sit with our hips like this. We can sit like this. We can stand. But changing your position frequently is one way to address that. So we've done our hip flexor stretch. The next one is the 99, and this just really opens up the hips a lot more. So you're gonna sit, you can sit on the ground for this. If you're sitting in a chair, I'll show you a variation that you can do, that you can do while you're at your desk. So we're here, you can put your hands behind, supporting yourself, or just keep it upright. And then we would just drop our knees in one direction, lean over the leg, the lead leg, come back up. And you would just do this a couple times back and forth, just being really controlled with your movement. So this is your 90-90. It opens up the external rotators of your hip, which can get really tight if you spend a lot of time in a seated position. Okay, so that's one way we can stretch it. The other way is called a supine piriformis stretch. So you go on your back, cross the leg over, and then bring your knee to your chest. You can also Hold onto the back of the thigh, 
floor in front of the shin. Okay, so you should actually feel it on the outside of the leg that's crossing over. So now if you're sitting in a chair, don't have a chair with me, but you can sit like this. You're gonna cross your leg over and then keep your chest upright and then lean forward. So let's just say I'm sitting in a chair, leaning forward. You're gonna feel it on the outside of that hip. Okay, so this is a stretch that you can integrate throughout your day. Hold it for at least 30 seconds on each side. You can just do it embedded throughout your day, maybe even just spending some time sitting like this instead of being in this flex position or maybe with your legs crossed, right? Just change up your position frequently. Okay, so I always start at the hips to address the issues downstream. Next is ankle mobility. Okay, we're moving to the ankle now. The knee is often very much associated with issues of the ankle and the foot or issues of the hip. So I like to just go jump to the ankle. And oftentimes when we correct our hip mobility, our hip issues or our ankle issues, it often corrects uh, the, the knee. So to, to move the ankle, if you're sitting in a chair, you can do this as well. You're gonna punch our arm through underneath the leg. I can bring my other arm underneath and I'm just giving myself a hug so that my, my ankle is hanging passively. You can you just do this if you're sitting in a chair that's tall enough, right? If your feet are touching the ground, you can hang it. So now I'm going to flex my foot. I wanna to try to just move my ankle without moving anything else. So I'm trying not to rotate my shin. So this is called ankle cars, controlled articular rotations. What I'm trying to do is go through the biggest range of motion that I can get through. Biggest pain-free range of motion. What we're looking for is a little bit of tolerable discomfort. Okay, so go nice and slow. You might feel like there's spots where you're skipping over. Maybe we just don't have those neural connections to that particular movement yet. But as you do this more and more, it's gonna get better. Okay, and then you would change directions. So you should just do about five slow rotations per side. If anyone's ever injured their ankles, an important one to do to regain that range of motion. And then we switch to the other side. So the biggest um, risk factor for an injury is a previous injury to that particular area. So if you've injured your ankle before, we now know that we have a loss of some sort of structural integrity uh, in that joint. So you're actually more likely to injure it again. So it's actually really, really important to continue to rehab it So I just do five in each direction. All right, next one I wanna work on is bringing our foot into ankle dorsiflexion. The ability to bring the foot closer to the shin. Okay. So for this one, I like to go on one knee, have the other knee up, and I'm just gonna drive that knee over the toes. So I'll just turn to face you. Ideally, I wanna drive right over the toes. Don't let it come in or too out, far out to the side. Just driving over the toes. And you should feel a little bit of a stretch in the posterior side of your leg, the Achilles. So if you're someone who likes to wear high heels, your Achilles can become shortened from being in this position throughout the day. So this is an important one to do. Even if it's a, just a small heel. So if you actually look at running shoes, they often have a, quite a bit of a heel lift. And I'll talk a little bit about footwear uh, later. I, can, I know that can be a controversial topic, but I'll tell you what I look for and how uh, I approach footwear as well. So we're just going back and forth a couple times. With high heels, I mean, I still like to wear them. When I go to weddings and stuff, I still wear them, but I treat it like junk food. You don't wanna wear them all the time. Once in a while, it's okay. And as long as you're doing the right things to compensate, Right, and address the, the dysfunctions that it causes, then it's okay. You get to still enjoy high heels. 
Okay, we'll switch sides. And spread the toes nice and wide. Just driving the knee right over the toes. Human beings weren't designed to stand on ramps throughout the day. So with a heel lift, I often hear this argument that we need a heel lift. We actually don't need a heel lift. Um, we were designed to just stand on flat surfaces throughout, throughout the day, but um, we've become very accustomed to, to standing with a heel lift and our bodies make compensations for that. You have two options really if you stand uh, with heels. You either stand on an angle leaning forward, which most people don't do, so that's just bizarre, or you can stand with, with compensations. Okay, so if I have a heel lift, I either stand like this or I make compensations so you can see that my, my knees have to bend, which actually loads my knees a little bit more. I put a lot more weight on the anterior side of my knee. I put a lot more weight onto my forefoot and I have, in order to stand upright, I have to have an uh, exaggerated curvature of the lower back, the lower doses. That can cause lower back problems as well. The moment I drop my heels to the ground, you can see that the weight starts to become more evenly distributed. What we are looking for is for the weight between the heel and the forefoot to be about 50%. So it should be evenly distribute, distributed. So every time you raise your heel up, we're transferring more and more load to the anterior side of the foot. Sorry, my dog just kicked the, the laptop over. Any questions so far? Everyone's following along. I don't know if there's anything in the chat there. I'm just there's gonna... nothing in the chat. It's all good. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. I wanted to ask you, Emily, when you're doing that forward um, stretch, because you know when you're doing squats and stuff, they always tell you never get your knee over your toes. Yeah. What do you, like, is that what you, that stretch, isn't it bringing your knee over your toes? Yeah, so I mean, and, and there's, there's two schools of thought with this. I am a believer, you can, it's okay to bring your knees over your toes. Um, I'm not quite sure where that that came from right where, where we started to say we have to keep our heel our knees below uh, behind our toes it's okay for your knees to travel above uh, in front of your toes what we don't want is to primarily do that see where i just bent my knees in a squat and now i'm just completely loading my knees what we want is to try to think about sitting right so i'm sitting back but the knees can come over the toes a little bit that's okay it's going to load a little bit but that that's totally fine um, our knees are designed to do that. And, okay. Yeah, our knees are completely designed to do that. If you're not able to get your knees over your toes, you're going to actually limit your range of motion in your squat and your hips upstream. So being able to have good ankle dorsiflexion means that we can spend time in like a deep squat position, opening up the hips. This is a very human-like position to do. It's a it should be a resting position. We often don't see people. Um, at least here in North America, we don't see a lot of people resting in this position. Uh, if you go over to the east, this is a very, very common position to see people resting in, right, where their ankles are, their knees are over their ankles, and that's totally okay, right? It's where the problem is, is if you're stuck here and then loading all of your torso weight forward, that, that's where it becomes a problem because you're putting way too much weight there. Um, so going downstream, so we started at the hips, mobilizing the tissues in the hips so that it can move effectively. We want to move the ankle around, right, getting to the dorsiflexion, to the offset, uh, wearing high heels or shoes with heels in general. Okay, the next thing we're going to do, I'm just going to pull this closer, is to start to work into the tissues of the feet. Okay, so I know some of you are eating your lunch, so don't do this if you're, if you're eating your lunch simultaneously. We're going to start to mobilize all of the tissues in the feet. If you're able to follow along, I highly encourage you to do it because you'll see, feel a very palpable difference between your feet as you do this. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to grab my big toe and then I'm going to grab the one that's adjacent to it. And all I'm going to do is split it back and forth. Like I mentioned before, we have 26 bones, 33 joints in each foot. You can imagine like locking your elbow out for in a, in, for a full day, 24 hours, not moving it. It's gonna feel, it's not gonna feel great <laughs> at the end of that little 24 hours. We think about all the small joints inside of our, our foot, it's kind of doing the same thing. If we're not moving it throughout the day, we can lead to pain and dysfunction. Okay, so I just go back and forth, I splay my toes, I move it side to side, wiggle around, and then I'm just gonna hop over to the next two. 
you know, before we had shoes, people walked around barefoot. We walked on uneven surfaces. We climbed on roots, we climbed on trees. So we had the ability, we were able to get our feet into a multitude of positions, right? All day we'd spend basically just massaging our feet passively from the environment. Now we don't really get that. We walk on pretty flat surfaces. <laughs> Sometimes if you're walking on Ottawa sidewalks, that's not the case, but uh, for the most part, we walk on pretty flat surfaces with shoes that enclose uh, and keep our feet relatively stable. So we don't get as much articulation through the toes as we used to. So this is how we, we basically, um, this is how we do it instead, since we don't have that option. We can't just go around walking around barefoot anymore. You know, just go back and forth. I like doing this, like if I'm taking a bath, it's a nice thing to do. It's nice and warm and it's a little slippery. So it's easier to just move your, your fingers throughout your toes. And I'm just trying to get as much articulation through the joint as possible. And then moving on to the last two. What you might feel is a little bit of a tearing sensation in here. That's the fascia. If it's not used to moving, it'll, you'll have some thick fascia in between each toe. So you might feel that. So this is something that I do. I often do before runs, help get my foot primed. Right, warm up the muscles, all of the small intrinsic muscles and extrinsic muscles, all the very the small joints getting blood flow through the foot. I'm trying to warm all of that up before I go for a run or a walk. Good. So once you've done all your toes, we're actually going to interlace our fingers in between each toe. So you might need to, to use your other hand to help move it around. You might just be able to get to the first knuckle might be able to get to the second if you can go go as far as you can when i first started doing this i was only able to just get to my first knuckle and now i can get all the way down and i start to rotate you know you could flex extend laterally bend twist rotate as much like i said as much articulation through the joints as possible that's better okay you can also take your other thumb place it into the arch of your foot twist So I did this every day uh, when I, once I learned about it, I did this every single day um, when I was working at the hospital. Uh, and I'll show you the next thing that I did as well, the, the, the foot, like I use a little cross ball to roll up my foot. Uh, those two things that I did, as well as changing my footwear, that just eliminated my plantar fasciitis. It was actually quite difficult at first though, because I didn't have the musculature in my foot to support my own body weight. So it was pretty challenging. And I'll talk about some strategies going forward. Cause oftentimes when I tell people, you know, if you need to strengthen your feet in order to support your own body weight, we take off our shoes and after 10 minutes, it starts to hurt. But this, we don't often walk into a gym and then go up to a bench press and lift up you know, 400 pounds on our first day, <laughs> or, you know, we just don't, that's not a good idea. It's a lot, it's way too much for your body. So we have to gradually ease into it. Maybe we'll start with some body weight stuff. Maybe we can add a little bit of weight all, uh, each time that we go. We do also know that we need to rest and do our mobility work in between those sessions in order to improve the strength. So thinking of the foot as any other part of the body, we treat it the same way. We can strengthen it by loading it, but we also have to rest it and we also have to do the mobility work. Okay, so once we've done that a couple times, now I'm gonna grab the entire foot and turn the sole to the ceiling, okay? Invert the foot. I treat it like dough, like a kneading dough. Just give yourself a nice foot massage. The widest part of your foot should be where your toes lay out. If you look at a lot of modern footwear though, you'll see that the where the toe box is, where the, the widest part should be, is actually the most narrow part of the shoe. Good. And then I go the other way. So I'm just going to grab the, the full, full sole and then turn the sole towards the floor. Another thing that was really cool about when I started doing this 
I did this every day. I used to complain about cold feet all the time, especially in the winter, it would be brutal. Um, when I started doing this, and my feet started to feel warmer in the winter and I actually didn't, like my, I didn't complain. I think the past two years I have not complained and I know I didn't complain because my, my spouse always tells me <laughs> that I do complain a lot about it, but I didn't complain about cold feet at all this, uh, these past two years. Uh, so it actually helped me have warmer feet. So if you're someone who has cold feet, this is a good thing for you to do as well because we're just getting more blood flow. Okay. So I'm not sure if you can see. I, there's actually a very visible um, on my end. I know it's a little bit hard to see on your end, but the color difference is different. This one's a lot more innervated. This one's, and if I actually feel the temperature difference, this one's a lot warmer. So we do the same thing on the other side. And you can just feel the ground beneath you if you're doing this. So we do the same thing on the other side. I'll just go through this side a little bit more quickly. All right, so we just go back and forth work our way through our toes. Okay, then interlace the fingers, we'll do the handshake. Okay, just move it around. directions. Then you would grab the entire foot, turn the sole to the ceiling. and then take the sole of the foot, turn it to the floor. So I call that toga, toe yoga. I have a video of it recorded. So if anyone wants uh, to follow along with it, I can, I can send it over as well. Okay, and the next thing I do, so you can use a tennis ball for this. My preference is a lacrosse ball, uh, just because it's a little bit harder, but uh, whatever you have access to, you can use. Some people have like yoga tune-up balls, whatever works. Um, you can also just use a, like a glass bottle, just be careful with it. You can use it for some parts of this. Okay, so all I do is I'm going to just slowly start to put more and more weight. Can you see that? Yeah, I'm just going to put more and more weight. And I'm trying to basically paint the underside of my foot with the ball. I'm basically just giving myself a massage. So I just go back and forth, front to back and get the entire sole of my foot. So I'll do that a couple times. And then I plant my foot, my heel on the ground, and I'm gonna work, I'll go this way, transversely, and breaking apart that tissue, making it more mobile. The thing, if you spend a lot of time on your feet, you actually probably do have quite strong feet, but we have a lot of mobility work to do before we can progress further. So all I do is put the, like I lift up, put weight down, and then work across. You can also go across your toes as well. Really just play around with it. You can also go on your toes, work into the heel a little bit too. This one feels so good. Um, I keep this, I keep a lacrosse ball. I mean, I, I'm one of those people, I carry a lacrosse ball in my purse, but you can, I keep one in my bathroom just underneath my sink. And every time I brush my teeth, I'll just do this. Okay, so that way I get two minutes a day, twice a day. I'm just rolling out the feet. So I did this and I did toe yoga and yeah, no more plantar fasciitis for me. So after I learned about that, I was pretty much sold. I said, how else can we really approach health and how much of our fitness industry how much of it really doesn't doesn't make sense and you know I was the type of person who spent a lot of time in a gym I often I, there was a point where I was going like 12 times a week just obsessively working out at the gym and I know a lot of people who still uh, do that but humans weren't designed to sit around all day and then you know blast through a workout for a whole hour 
We were designed to move throughout our day, to stand up, to climb things, to throw things. So I've really shifted my focus on the way I train to be more in tune with what humans were designed to be like. So I actually don't spend as much time training in a gym anymore whenever I can. I'd much rather work in my garden, spend time there. I'd much rather go for a hike. These are all things that are much more aligned with how humans were designed and what we were built to do. Okay, so just go back and forth and you'll get, you'll get better at using these balls. You can play around with it as well. There we go. So that's the foot rollout. I think I have a video of that one too. So if anyone wants that, I can send that over. Next thing. So now we've done all the mobility work that I want to do. Now I don't I don't do all of this every day. You definitely don't have to do all of this every day, but these are just tools that you can integrate into your day-to-day -day routine. Okay, so now on to the strengthening part. Since mobility, now we're gonna move on to strength and how can we build the tissues, those four layers of muscle in the foot? How can we develop those? How can we develop those deep intrinsic muscles in the foot? So I'm back up so you can see my whole, my whole body. Okay, so the first one we're going to do is called a foot trace. So I'm going to put most of my weight on my left leg. Okay, and I'm basically going to trace the outline of my foot. Okay, so here I'm rolling onto the outer edge of the right foot, onto the heel, and then onto the inner edge. Okay, and I gradually start to put more and more weight on that foot. As you get better at this, you won't have to look down at the ground to see what you're doing anymore. And I want you to be more in tune about what you're feeling. What are the senses coming in from your foot? What do you feel underneath your foot? Let those signals travel through your brain and let your body respond. So do that a couple times, change directions. And we're getting more mobility through the ankle here. I'll give you an example of someone that I worked with uh, that we did basically all of this stuff that I was doing. He had recently su suffered from a stroke um, and he was just sitting in a wheelchair and he didn't walk. He was in a wheelchair and this is all we did. We did, I got him to roll his foot out while he was in the chair on the ground with a slow cross ball. We did some toe mobility, the toe yoga, so I got him to do that himself. We started off by just rolling off his ankles and day by day, um, he started to be able to just regain some mobility in his foot. That six month period after a stroke is really crucial when we switch to the other side. Um, so yeah, we did all of that. And yeah, long story short, now he is walking with a walker, but he's able to walk. So the sensations that we feel for that sensory input, he just could not feel the ground beneath him. He lost the sensation from his foot, but we retaught him how to develop the sensation. We can do the same thing for ourselves. It takes practice. It takes practice to feel and to differentiate the senses. I think back to like when I was in kindergarten learning about my primary colors. You can show me like eight shades of yellow. It's still going to be yellow today. But I noticed that the, the more I learn about colors, that there's so many different shades and there's so many different types of glossiness. Like so. Our senses become more attuned the more we practice it. My spouse is a, uh, is a massage therapist and he can just feel very subtle changes in people's bodies okay, when they can feel when muscles release. So the more you do this, the more you're going to train yourself to be more aware of the senses coming in from your feet. I like to say, get, get your daily dose of vitamin T, vitamin texture. Okay? So feel different surfaces on the ground. It's not the too hard. You can walk on hardwood, walk on carpet, maybe walk on some grass, feel what a yoga mat feels like beneath, feel what types of different yoga mats feel like. As many sensations as you can get, the better. Good. Okay. Next, we're going to go into a single leg balance. So all I'm going to do is I want to really spread my toes nice and wide on the ground. I'll just show you the tripod position. So if I'm holding up my foot here, this is your tripod. So just below the big toe, just below the pinky toe, so the head of the first and fifth metatarsal, and then the heel. Between those three points, I want to think of evenly distributing my weight amongst those three points. Okay, so spread my toes nice and wide. I'm gonna stand on the one foot, 
So I like to have a slight bend to my knees just so I have some more wiggle room. I'm just gonna lift up my foot. What you'll notice is that by default, my hips have to be stacked in this really nice, my hip has to be stacked over my knee, my knee has to be stacked over my ankle. And you'll notice that if you're doing this, you're going to start to do a little bit of shaking. Your, your foot's going to make, your ankle's going to make a lot of little tiny micro adjustments. And we're going to start to develop strength in the places surrounding the ankle, surrounding the knee, and surrounding the hip. So like I said, if you've ever had knee injuries or ankle injuries, this is an important one to do because we're going to develop the supporting musculature to help keep us upright. Okay, to take it another step further, what we're going to do is just close our eyes. So if you are going to do this, just make sure that you have enough space. If you start to, to hop around and stuff, just open your eyes. I want people to feel safe when they're doing this. Okay, so you just close your eyes. You're seeing, we're taking away a whole sensation uh, when we're doing this. Balance is determined by three things. You have your visual system. So obviously what you see and your relation to the horizon. You have your vestibular system, those are your inner ear canals that tell you what orientation you are relative to gravity. And then you have your proprioceptive system. What does the environment feel like to you? Where is your body in space? And when we do this, we're really training that proprioceptive system to work better. Okay, change size. Okay, one of the biggest risk factors when we look at falls too is when people's vision go, we worry that they're gonna fall. So by training the proprioceptive system, it's something that can help. Okay, so you just try it down on one foot. This is stuff that I like to do, you know, if I'm washing dishes, it's a little bit challenging sometimes too, but you could challenge yourself if you're washing dishes, if you're standing up, maybe not when you're cooking with a knife in your hand. Okay, close your eyes. Very simple. I like to try to take big, complex problems, simple solutions. Okay, next thing we're doing is gonna go into, again, single leg balance. We're making it more challenging now. So you're gonna tap in front of you. So I'd like to think of a compass when I'm doing that. So I'm tapping, tapping north, east, south, and then west. This one's a little bit more challenging. Every time you go through that, we're gonna go a little bit further away from our bodies. Or if you want an extra challenge, you can close your eyes while you do this. Really challenge your balance. Okay, and you'd switch to the other side. I'll show you another thing you can do here. I'm just taking my, my scrunchie. I mean, you can pick it up. Drop. So we're just picking it up. If you have kids, these are always fun games to play with them. <laughs> I, uh, my nieces and nephews, whenever they were, would come over, I have some balance beams that I like to, to play on, but we always play games. And I challenge them uh, to, to play games with only their feet. It's a good way to, for me to get my training in, get my balance work in, but they always have fun doing it as well. Kids are awesome at balancing too, you'll notice. Good. Okay, so those are just some of the drills. You're gonna feel, okay, that, that's actually pretty sore on, on the ankles now. I felt like my, my, the surrounding musculature of my ankle had to work really hard in order to keep me upright. Some people also feel it around the knee, the legs, into the glutes, just to keep yourself upright. You have to engage a lot of muscles, and oftentimes it's those accessory muscles that we don't often think of when we're doing it. Okay. Um, so moving on just day to day, what can you do to care for your feet? My number one recommendation is just spend some time barefoot. I don't mean you have to go get, throw all your shoes <laughs> in the garbage and change all of your shoes over. Just if you spend some time at home in slippers, maybe just spend 10 minutes a day barefoot and expose yourself to different textures, stand on different surfaces, maybe do some balance drills, maybe do some toga. Uh, footwear choices. Now when I'm looking for footwear, I look for the following criteria. Wide, thin, flat, and flexible. Wide, as in wide toe box to accommodate the wideness of my foot so that it doesn't squeeze it together. 
thin so that it doesn't have a heel lift. Now, I'll talk a little bit about transitioning as well when you're going from, if you're used to wearing high heels every day, I, highly, I don't actually recommend you transition right away and buy something that has a really flat, uh, that's really flat because it will be challenging for you to do. So this is something you would gradually transition to do. Uh, thin so uh, flat so flex and flexible, right? Making sure that the, the foot can, the shoe can bend and twist in a way that lets your foot function the way a foot should. It allows your 33 joints to move independently and together. How should, the foot is beautifully designed. For, for many, many years, we've designed the foot to function optimally. It's really hard to out-engineer how good that is. So basically what I look for when I'm looking for a shoe is a foot, uh, is a shoe that will allow my foot to function as a foot while also protecting my foot. When you are transitioning, so let's say you are wearing orthotics or you're wearing high heels or very supportive shoes, it's going to be really challenging because it's going to feel like you're barefoot uh, if you transition to a shoe like this. So what I recommend is to start off with five to 10 minutes a day. Even just taking off your shoes, putting on the new, the, the new ones, the flat ones, right? Spend 10 minutes a day. Once you start, your feet start to feel a little sore in that, that might be your limit for that day. We've strengthened the muscles enough. Now it's time to rest. So switch back to your older shoes. Spend that time. The next day we can approach it again. We're gonna maybe spend 15 to 20 minutes in it. Switch back to your shoes. It's important to give your body rest. The same way we'd rest all our other muscles, we wanna treat our feet the same way. On top of that, we would do our mobility work that I showed you earlier. Having a daily mobility practice for your feet, really important. I have clients that now message me ever since I showed them toga. So every morning, they, that's their routine. They do their foot mobility and have their cup of tea. So having a daily uh, mobility practice is, is important. Um, and the other thing you can do uh, is wear toe spacers throughout your day. So I'll show you what those look like. You can get these online. I also have them available. If you wear really narrow, narrow shoes and you have uh, your feet are closed together like this, you can see that if I actually pull my big toe towards the midline, I start to develop a little bit of a bunion. That's where bunion is from. So wearing toe spacers will help kind of offset and negate the effects of wearing really tight shoes. Now, if you are used to wearing tight shoes, if your toes are really bunched together, this will be challenging. So that's all to wear. And I just wear it throughout the day. Uh, you, again, same idea with this one. You would just wear it for like 10, 15 minutes and then gradually increase the amount of time you wear it throughout the day. If you look at your feet, uh, feet, your toes should not be, be touching each other. If you look at a baby's foot, their feet don't touch. If you look at um, tribes that have not worn shoes before, their toes actually don't touch each other as well. And that's anatomically speaking, the most efficient position to be in. We think about balance, the widest part, if, if you have a wide surface to, to stand on, it's gonna be easier to balance. If you have a really narrow surface to stand on, it's harder to balance, it's as simple as that. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's all I have today. I know I speak really quickly. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to, to me. My name is Emily Gooding. Uh, I think uh, I can share my, my contact information in the, the chat as well. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy for you to answer them as well. That was really great, Emily. I think uh, <laughs> I could see how we could spend like a half an hour just doing foot stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. So I'm glad that we recorded this. I'm going to stop it now.